when I had a, a schedule set forth of when we started James, I think I charted a course of how long it would take to get to James. You just kind of get an idea. I thought we would finish the first week of December. So we are now in the latter portions of chapter four, and we still have chapter five. And I think it's good for us that we're taking our time. Um, though it's been a, a, a weighty book, but it, I think it's it's done well for us. And now we're in chapter four. Look at chapter 13. I mean, chapter, verse 13. We're going to read through verse 17. This is God's inspired and inerrant word. Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this and that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Pray with me. Father, this evening, we come before your word and we desire for your Holy Spirit to teach us, to not merely teach us, but to pierce our hearts to give us understanding of the mind and that as we do these things that, or you do these things within us, that you would transform us, that we would be not just corrected, but encouraged to do what is right. And so I thank you for your word. I thank you for the exhortation. And oh Lord, help us to apply this in Christ's name. Amen. Tonight's message is titled, the arrogance, the arrogance among us. The arrogance among us. I have a bit of a story for you as an illustration to set us forth in our passage. In 1998, a company was offered a deal to buy Google. This is 1998, so you could imagine what maybe Google was worth then. Some of you weren't even born in this room, so it's kind of funny. Um, they offered this particular company to buy Google for $1 million. This company refused the offer. As little as four years later, so if you fast forward 2002, this company, this particular company that I'm talking about, realized that they had made a mistake. So they went back and offered Google to buy it now for $3 billion. Google countered at $5 billion. This company that I'm talking about refused to buy it even for $5 billion. Today, Google is now worth $1.7 trillion. In 2006, this same company offered to buy Facebook for $1.1 billion. Right before they were going to close the deal, they changed the deal on Facebook and they said, no, now we will only buy it for $800 million. Facebook denied the offer. Listen, many different things are happening in this company during this time and Projected values are difficult to understand. But it needs us to say they keep on making these same mistakes. So in 2008, during the market crash, for some of you that remember, this company was struggling and the tables were turned. So Microsoft came to this company and offered to buy it for $44.6 billion. The market crashed. Easy money was not easy anymore. This particular company 
company turned down the offer for $44.6 billion. In 2016, the fate of this company was realized. Verizon came in and bought the company for only, remember this, they were offered $44.6 billion. They're offered $4.6 billion. They sold it, and the fate of this original company was gone. A lot of what that built, that company built was dismantled. Things were sold off. This company is, uh, you guys remember the search engine, Yahoo? Who still uses Yahoo? You look around, right? No one. As financial forecasters looked at all the failures, all the decisions that were being made by Yahoo all the way back to their mid-90s, and they fast forward, and the financial world came to one conclusion about what Yahoo had done throughout their existence and why they made so many really bad decisions. And the funny thing is, their assessment was a moral one. They all said that all the decisions that Yahoo was making were based in ego or arrogance or pride. They thought themselves bigger than Google. They thought themselves greater than Facebook. They thought themselves greater than Microsoft. And now nothing. Though this story is not a, an exact parallel to our passage, but our text, what it does do for us is it shows us as individuals that when decisions are made, when they're done in arrogance, there's much failure and downfall. James is not addressing a company, right? He doesn't address the business, but he, address, he addresses the businessman or the businesswoman. He doesn't address the business that by seeking to see what the, the heart of the business is, but he seeks the heart of the person that has been given stewardship over much things. Look, at you may not be a business person, but that doesn't mean that God has not given you time, effort, work, and resources to steward over your own life. As a matter of fact, he's given you a soul. And that soul is more valuable than anything you own. So this evening, I have three points that I want you to consider. First one is arrogant planning. The second one is humble existence. And the third is humble dependence. Arrogant planning. I don't know if you've read this portion of scripture, if you've looked at it intently and, and thought to yourself, pause, how does this apply to me? Because there's phrasing, there's even verbiage that we use even in our Christian lingo almost every day. Even chapter 17, I remember that I've, I've used that in counseling, I don't know how many times. I use it thousands of times. But what is James calling our attention to? Because he is calling attention, he's in verse 13, if you take a look, he says, Come now, you who say. And the come now is one of those kind of like the listen up, the truly, truly, like open your ears. I'm about to tell you something that is of vital importance. And he says, you who say. And, and it, it's addressing a particular person. I, I want you to understand this, but... I don't want you to set aside and say, well, you know, there's particular things that are going to be said, but they don't really apply to me. Trust me. 
we're all guilty of what James is about to tell us. And he tells you, come now, you who say, think, he says, think about what you say, either out loud or in your heart, about what he's about to address. He is addressing this particular group, group, but he calls attention to what? Everything is a matter of the heart. Look, let me give you a shortcut to all of life right now. Everything in life is a matter of the heart and it's a matter of worship. Everything. Everything. As a matter of fact, there's no one on this earth that doesn't worship something. Even if you call yourself an atheist, you trust me, you worship something. And James is saying, look, I'm going to move forward. He said a lot to this point. And he's saying, look, come now. Take a look, take a peer into your heart, into where the motives and desires come from. So what is the issue? What is the issue with this metaphorical person or, or persons that he's saying, come now, that you say, that you that say these things? What is the issue? The text tells us in the second half, it says, you, this is what he says. You see the quotations. Today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. If you take pause, if you read that anywhere else outside of the Bible, would you think there's something wrong here? Let's be really honest. You would not say that. You would not say that. You would say, that makes sense. It looks like there's some business people just having a conversation about what they're going to do. That's not the problem. That is not the problem. Let me, let me show you, even as a shortcut to the whole sermon. As a matter of fact, if I read this, you can leave after I'm done. But don't. But look to Romans chapter 1. Romans 1, just one verse, look at verse 28, and I literally only want to read the first half of that verse. This is what he says. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer. This is the problem of all of humanity. Every person that has not come to to surrender to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, this is their problem. That every part of their life and all their planning is without acknowledgement of God. Go back to James. And listen to this metaphorical person that James is saying. This is what he says. He says, without the acknowledgement of God, what we will do is, let's make a plan. We'll go today or we'll leave tomorrow. Okay, keep going. We will go to such and such a city. We will spend a year. We will engage in business. We will make a profit. And tack on to the end of every single one of those. And we will do it without God. He's nowhere in our thinking. This person has the date set, the place, the time spent, the dealings, what he will do there. And you know what they're also doing? They're counting all their money already. Do you hear the arrogance in that? Do you hear how like we're even counting all our chips? I'm going to cash in. It is, it is that man, again, in Luke 12, I remind you, because we've been to Luke 12 multiple times, but look, look to Luke chapter 12, because the best teacher for us is always Jesus. And Luke, Luke 12 tells us of this, this parable of the same thing, this really arrogant man.
It starts out with verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. He kind of rebukes them. Who are, why am I like the, the judge over your inheritance? What, what is this? Is this like people's court? It's like, I'm not involved with these things. So he jumps down to verse 16. He's like, well, I'm going to do the best thing for them. I'm going to give them a parable. He told them in a parable, verse 16, saying, the land of a rich man was very pro pro productive and began to reason with himself. There's problem number one. Do you see that? He began to reason with himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tell, tear down my barns to build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, oh, my soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Doesn't that sound like eat, drink, or for tomorrow we die? A futile life, a life that is just no consciousness of God and his, and his providence. No. Verse, six, verse 20. But God said to him, and this is right. If God has something to say about you, listen, he's always right, okay? So I'm going to tell you, if you are like this man, he's saying this to you. You fool. The very night, this very night, your soul is required of you. And now who will own what is what you have prepared? What will you do with all this? You can't take it with you. And you're arrogant to decide for yourself that this is not a big deal. Romans 1, 28, does, does it not say that? You ceased and you decided to not acknowledge God. And then what God does, Romans 8, 28, I mean, 1, 28, second part, he says he gives them over to a depraved mind. Now you can't even think right. The arrogant boasting, turn back to James. The arrogant boasting reveal, reveals the, the attitude towards God and the truth of his his sovereignty, listen, is, is not in their minds at all. This is presumption at its highest level. If you are to presume about the person to the right or left of you, front and behind you, you know what? But if you presume upon God, that's a high degree of presumption. This warning is not new. It's riddled all over Scripture. If I had to walk you through all of it, but I won't, but I'll give you this. In Proverbs 27, 1, it says this, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. Listen, it's this religion of autonomy. Autonomy just meaning that I am the arbitrator of all my life. I'm in charge. I'm a self-made man or woman. My life is self-determined, self-ruled. I am sovereign. I dictate. That's the heart of that man, that businessman. I'll go here and there. Listen, James is not concerned with the business planning or, or the profit. It, it has nothing to do with that. It, it's really the exclusion of God. That's the issue. This is the heart of Satan. Remember Isaiah 14, 13 and 14, he has these, these sayings. He starts out by saying, I said in, I, you said in your heart, God is telling him, saying, you said this in your heart. Then he begins to recite what Satan had in his heart. And I'll, I'll give you what he says. He says, I will ascend to the heavens. I will rise to my throne. I will sit on the mount. I will ascend above the heights. I will make myself like the most high. No, you won't. No, you won't. 
And he didn't. And I'll tell you this, no one is going to get away with that kind of talk. Not one soul will get away with that kind of talk. You know, we have the story of, of um, Nebuchadnezzar. And we tell the story, I think sometimes when you have a VBS or something like that, it's kind of fun to, to you know, get the kids or dress up one of the adults, one of the guys, and, and have him go out into the grass and act like he's eating grass, like Nebuchadnezzar. Have you ever seen that? I thought it's like really funny. But the story of Nebuchadnezzar is not really funny. And what happened to him was not funny at all. As a matter of fact, let's turn there. Let's go to Daniel chapter 4. You have this really, this like an amazing drama happening. I don't know if you've seen this. Like R.C. Sproul says this all the time. He goes, if you ever, when you read scripture, especially narratives, like the, the best way you could capture just the hearts of, of what you're reading is to read the drama. Like look, read it and see it for what it is. Like it, this is dramatic. So you have this whole thing. I'll kind of set it up. You have this, this, this dream and this, this vision that Daniel has, right? And, and the verses like 19 to 27. And then it gets down to these latter verses in verse 28. And, you know, all these, these um, magicians are coming together to try to figure out this dream, this vision. But the only one that could tell him what the vision meant was Daniel. And Nebuchadnezzar feared. He actually says it, Luke, verse 30. The king reflected and said, is this not Babylon the great, which, oh, wait, hold on. I'm going forward. He goes a few verses before that. He tells them, like, I fear about this vision. So Daniel begins to tell him the vision. I'm not going to go through the whole thing because we don't have time. He tells them the vision, everything that was to come. And it wasn't good. It was not good. Months pass. Months pass. Actually, the, the, on our passage, it tells us that about 12 months pass. And, and then we get to verse 30. The king reflected. I mean, he must have thought that it was over. Like, okay, this vision has not started. Whatever was, was the vision, it's not coming true. So he says this. He reflected on himself, verse 30. Is this not Babylon the great? which I myself have built as a royal residence by the, the might of my power and for the, glor and for the glory of my majesty. Oh, man. That's pretty arrogant, right? So God steps in. Verse 31, while the words were in kings, the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, you to you, it is declared. Sovereignty or your supposed rule has been removed from you. And you will be driven away from mankind and you're, you will dwell in places with, will, will be with the beast of the field. You'll be given grass to eat like cattle. And for seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Nebuchadnezzar, you're not in charge. I raise up and I tear down. Did he not say that? You know, this is the problem. We, we forget so easily that this is true. Nebuchadnezzar learned this the hard way, right? Maybe this wasn't a surprise to an unbelieving king to operate in this kind of arrogance. But the question is really, for those of us that believe, listen, for those of us that believe, and better yet, for those of us that hold to reform theology, to the sovereignty of God and salvation, to the sovereignty of God in all things, literally to everything, this is what we believe. 
I mean, it says it. Romans 8, 28. We read this. Listen, we read this. And we all like what it says. God causes all things to work for good. What is he saying? Is he not saying that he's sovereign over the believer's life? At the end of the verse, it says, according to his purpose. Listen, James will help us with this principles. To understand this, because you can't just claim to believe this and then set it aside when you're going to start making some plans. No, turn back to James. My second point is humble existence, and this is where we get much help. Verse 14. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Listen, he's... he's we don't know what tomorrow holds. Jesus said it himself, Matthew 6.34. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care about itself or care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Isn't that true? You don't have to add to tomorrow. And, and you don't have to carry over the troubles of today into tomorrow. No, do you know what? Life is too short. This is the point of what he's saying. Listen, why must, he tells us this, my, why must you have, or why must we as a church have a little touch on tomorrow, a light touch on tomorrow? I'm not against planning. It's not what it's saying. This is why. Because life is so short and uncertain. You have to have a light touch. The, the word even here for vapor, it could also be transited smoke. But let me tell you, when vapor goes up, does it have a decision of itself to dissipate? No, it just dissipates. When smoke goes up, does it have, a, does it have its own directive on which way to go? No, the wind comes and it blows it away. And then it's gone. This is us. Life is short and fragile. Our lives are here and then again they're gone. Blown away like smoke. This same idea is found again in all of Scripture. We, we worry about so much, and, and in worrying, we forget about who? God. T turn to Job chapter 7 with me. We're going to go into the Psalms also, but let's start in Job. Chapter 7, look at verse 7. It says, remember that my, that my life is but a breath. You, you, you go up, let's say you go to the mountains and, and you could see your breath, right? You go, and you see the, and how long is it there? It's gone, right? It's like a breath. Ch chapter 8, Job also, verse 9, but we are for we are only of yesterday and know nothing, because our days on earth are as a shadow. It sounds a, a bit pessimistic, right? But it, it really isn't. It's just reality. Turn to Psalm 39. Psalm 39, verse 4. It says, Lord, make me to know my end. That's a good thing, right? To, to know that you have an end and it's okay if God is in control of it, right? Make me to know my end 
and what it is to extend the, the extent of my days. Let me know how transient I am. Let me know how transient I am. That's such a big deal. It's, it, the Bible calls believers sojourners and pilgrims on the land. This is not your home. This is not your final destination. This is, this is just your passing through. Verse 5, Behold, you have made my days as a hand's breath, and my life as nothing in your sight. Surely every man and his, at his best is a mere breath. Breath. That's what we are. Psalm 90. Turn all the way to Psalm 90. Look at verse 10. As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow. For soon it is gone and we fly away. We're here and then we're gone. Psalm 102. Verse 3. For my days have been consumed in smoke. And my bones have been scorched like a hearth. Your days are here. They're gone. They're, they're burnt up. Time. The thing you can't overspend and you can't save. Psalm 144. And this sums up all of the ones that I've just read. Verse 4. Man is like a mere breath. His days are like a passing shadow. You know, it's, it's inescapable, right? And if you think about your mortality, which you should, you have to understand what, what is our only purpose here in life. We, we have to understand that life is fleeting. It's like grasping for the wind. It's, it's like trying to hold water in your hand. But the pessimist in James, or the presumptuous man, the arrogant man, he doesn't find this reality. Turn back to James. You know, the main point of all this is to acknowledge the Lord in our brief existence. Psalm 90 verse 12 says this. So teach us to number our days. That we may present you to you a heart of wisdom. It's wise to do that. It's wise to number your days. It's wise to look at your mortality and, and, and look at how he, he tells us in verse 14. That this is your life. It's here and it's gone. It's, and it's now what do you do with that information? It's to find wisdom is one of the biggest things. And where is wisdom found? It's found in God. And it's found at the foot of the cross. The Bible says that the cross is the wisdom of God and the power of God. So if you have not come to surrender to Christ, your life is a vapor and it will be wasted. But he pleads with you. Come to me, all those who are weak and heavy laden, and you will find rest. For this life and the life to come. But if you are presumptuous and you are arrogant. 
and you make your own plans and you're trying to make your own way to heaven, that's the epitome of the highest type of arrogance. That God tells you there's only one way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Not one can go a different way. But for believers, listen, their exhortation is a bit different. Let, let me show you that exhortation, if it's, if it's helpful, and I know it is in Ephesians chapter 5. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. And there's, this, there's this, Paul goes into this exhortation to believers, and he giving them almost the same exact kind of advice that, that James tells us. This is why the scriptures are so amazing. The, the, the analogia of scripture, that the scriptures are all saying the same thing. And Paul tells us this. This is, this is how you ought to see your life, that you, would not, that you would see it as a vapor, but not waste it. And this is what he says in verse 15, chapter 5. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. This is your preoccupation with all of life, is if one thing you say to yourself when you wake up, the first thought in your head should be, what is the will of God today for me? This is how you don't waste your life. That the little bitty vapor that's here and gone, it's not wasted, it's, it's used. For kingdom purposes. This is Paul being so helpful. Don't be foolish. But seek God's will and his understanding. Our last point is humble dependence. Humble dependence. It says this in verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, this is really helpful because in the Greek, it doesn't sound like that. He, he says something like this. He says, instead, you ought to say, he says, he says something like this, and, and it's not completely exact because it's Greek, but he says something like this. He says, you that, had, that said, verse 13, Instead of doing that, do this instead. Do this verbiage. And he's not just talking about verbiage. He's not just saying it like, just say it out loud. I'm going to talk about that later. But he's talking about the heart of the issue. He says, instead of doing this, instead of thir verse 13, instead of not acknowledging God or not even giving thought to him to all your planning, no, James says, don't do that. But say, if the Lord wills. Listen, this is not some pious addendum because I know this is where we could err, okay? This is not some pious, holy addendum that you could, what you could do is you tack it in at the end of whatever you're planning to do. You've heard this before, right? Hey, um... Are you going to go here and there? It's like, yeah, if the Lord wills. That's not what James is saying. Look at It's not some mindless response to like an invitation. It's like someone tells you, hey, you're going to be at that wedding on, on Thursday. If the Lord wills. Wait, hold on. Are you going? Well, I don't know. Are you going to RSVP? If the Lord wills. <laughs> That's not what he's saying. It's also not this. It's not some fatalistic expression. What I mean is this. It's not like if the Lord wills and you throw your hands up. Well, you know what? You went on that second interview. They haven't called you back. What should you do? 
Well, I'm going to wait on the Lord and we'll see if the Lord wills for me to have that job. Call them. Go to their office. It's not pious. You're not holy by doing something like that. Both are wrong. Listen, that attacking on at the end like some pious addendum or being fatalistic is wrong also. This is not what he's saying. It's not this excuse to, to throw away responsibility for, for actions or, or, or things that you ought to be doing. This is, this is how it sounds funny because, listen, it's like saying, hey, um, are, are you going to pray for that brother that has cancer? Well, if the Lord wills, I will. It becomes kind of ridiculous, right? But this is not what he's saying. Look at, I want you to see the heart of Paul because Paul did this a lot. Or at least some of the times. Look at Acts chapter, chapter 18. He did this a few times, and, and I'm just going to highlight some of them. In Acts 18, verse 21, he says this, but taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills. And he set sail for Ephesus. Okay, he says it there. Look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 10. He's talking about the, the believers here. It says, always in my prayers, making requests. If God, if perhaps now, at last, by the will of God, same phrasing, I may su succeed to come to you. And then he says it again. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. You can write these down because I'm just going to keep moving. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 19, he says this. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills. See, he keeps on saying this. He says it again in, in, in chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians. And then I believe he wrote Hebrews. So I'm just going to throw it in there. Hebrews 6.3. He says it again. Now, do you believe Paul was slapping at the back of his these verses, or at the middle of these verses, this frivolous phrase, if God wills. Think about the life of Paul, and when he's telling them, if the Lord wills, I'll come back to you. Knowing rightly that he may never see them again. But he tells them, if I come back, if the Lord wills, I will come and see you. The, you see the heart of Paul? His desire is to see them again. Yes, it's true. But no, he is not going to make that decision for himself. Because he is in a difficult situation. Perils at all sides. He had so much to think through. But everything that he would do would be passed through the sovereignty of God. It, it's, it's the heart of it. And later on, I'm going to quote John Calvin, but I want you to think through this. Again, it sounds funny, but think about the questions we would say. If I would ask you, hey, are you going to be here on Sunday to worship with us? And if you tell me, if the Lord wills, I'm going to tell you, Guess what, bro? You don't have to think through that. He does will. Are you going to be at men's discipleship on Saturday morning? If the Lord wills. Stop doing that. It's, it's, it's at the least, it's irreverent. And it's borderline taking the Lord's name in vain. Calvin said this, John Calvin makes a great observation to this. This is what he says, quote, Paul and, the, Paul and the other apostles do not always state this condition, this if the Lord wills. What was important was that they had it as a principle 
fixed in their minds that they would do nothing without the permission of God. Nothing. I have my, my being and my life in God. That I woke up this morning, this is God. It's literally the, the, the heart and the sincerity. Listen, this is just a basic, sincere appreciation of God's control in every affair of your life. Specific and non-specific. Well, the Lord wills a lot of things, right? He wills that you share the gospel with your neighbor. He wills that you love your wife. He wills that you disciple your, cho your children. He wills all these things. Now, if you make your separate plans, it's okay. If the Lord wills, we will do this. In closing, I want to just go through verse 16 and 17. It says, but as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Any thinking outside of everything that we just read, everything that I just said, any thinking outside of that, he calls it arrogance, and then he elevates it and calls it evil. Listen, when he says, but it, as it is, you boast, this word boast means to be a loud mouth. It's not as though you're just boasting like, oh, you know, just casually boast. No, you're a loud mouth. You're speaking against, arrogantly against God and his providence. You've replaced God with your own plans. It's what John calls in, in 1 John 2.16, he calls it the pride of life. This is the same sense of self-sufficiency, self-importance. That's characterized by worldliness. Even worse, this type of evil that, that only leaves out God outside of your plans. But the same word for evil is used to describe the devil. Remember this, he calls him the evil one. John 17, Matthew 13, Ephesians 6, 1 John 2, the evil one, Satan himself. Remember, he's the father of lies. The, the Isaiah I, I, I problem. Look at verse 17, though. And as I read this, I want you to think of all the weeks past. If you've been here since we were in chapter 1, think of everything. Because the thought process in James's mind is everything... From chapter 1, the beginning of my letter that I sent you, he said, all the way to this point, everything that you've learned, everything that you've understood to know what is right, and he puts it in verse 17, he says this, Therefore, to one who knows, or to the one that knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. That's heavy. We are so we are so guilty of so many sins of omission. I, I think they would actually count greater than your sins of submission. The sins of omission are they're only in your mind and in your heart. He tells these believers, and, and don't get me wrong, he's talking to believers here. He, he describes him because the one that knows the right, who's the one that knows righteousness? Believers. The one that knows the will of God 
the one that affirms the truth about his sovereignty, his control over their own life and all the affairs in the world. He goes, the one that knows that. So what does it mean? What does he mean by verse 17? Like I said earlier, everything that you learned to this point. In short, those who know God have been born again, have passed from death to life. The ones that have received the transplanted heart that, that God gives you new loves, new desires, and the will to do His will. Listen, those who know God or who know God's will are responsible to obey it. If you do not, it's sin. You know, the odd thing is, it's not sin for the unbeliever. This is a sin that's very particular to the believers only. Just leaving the Lord out of all your affairs and not doing the right thing or the right things that you know are right because you know God is sin. The sin of disregarding God and what He wants to do in you and through you because you don't belong to yourself. To not do and to not submit to Him is one of the greatest sins of a Christian's life. Let me give you some things that if I could even just put more weight on your conscience and more things that now you're not going to have an excuse to not do. I'm going to tell you some of them. You should share the gospel. You should repent of specific sin. You should humble yourself. You should consider serving your local church. You should kill besetting sin. And the greatest of all, if you sit before me, you do not know Christ. You most definitely should surrender your life to Christ. Don't wait till tomorrow. Life is a vapor. Believer, acknowledge God in all that you are and all that you do. And you will never be or be able to be accused of the sin of omission. And go and do the right thing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is true and it is sharper than any two-edged sword. That it cuts going in and it cuts coming out, Lord. So I pray now that you would cut away those things that do not belong. And that we would live lives that are honoring to you. That the direction of our life would be to live lives that are righteous, not in our own righteousness, but this imputed righteousness that belongs to us through Christ. That you would continue to drive us back to the cross, that we would see its value. Lord, that in everything that we do, that we would acknowledge you in our hearts and say, your will be done. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.